OK. All right. So um, so we are actually um, recording the meeting. We've checked with all of the, the, the speakers and participants. But if anyone who's uh, who's joined us isn't uh, happy with the idea, then uh, I'm afraid there's only one option to you, which is to to leave the meeting. I'm afraid Faisal, great for, to, to see you that you, you're joining us on the on the panel. Um, so uh, welcome, everybody. This is a um, standalone um, webinar by, organized by the Modern Energy Cooking Services um, program. Um, we're delighted to not only have um, Hilda Galt uh, with us to speak on a recent um, piece of work that she and her colleagues have done for us, which we're really super excited about, um, but also we have a, a, um, a very high level panel. Um, I can see Matt, you've just, just joined us as well. That's great to see you, Matt. Um, and uh, I'll introduce the panel um, once we've heard from, from Hilda. And we've got a good length of time today to discuss, I think, some some findings and some uh, key issues that I think are massively important for not only the clean cooking sector, but the energy access sector uh, more generally. Um, so really looking forward to that. Um, just to say that MEX, for those of you that don't know us, um, we are a UK aid um, funded program. We've been going for about four years. We're a seven year program, so we're about just around halfway through. The whole raison d'etre of MEX is to raise the profile and support the development of um, higher tier um, solutions to the clean cooking challenge. Uh, we've had a lot of focus on electric cooking, but we've done work over the years on LPG, on ethanol, on biogas, um, and also on bio LPG and hydrogen. So we work across, and ethanol, sorry, uh, we work across a whole range of different fuels and, and um, are really excited about um, the uh, new, I guess, directions that um, the clean cooking uh, industry is, is, is moving in. One of the really important components of all of this is how do we best fund the, um, the accessibility of uh, these clean cooking solutions globally? Uh, what are the different ways that we can do that? We've done a lot of pieces of work on this over the last few few years. We've had a series of reports that we co-authored with uh, Energy for Impact, uh, finalising in a major review of the, 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 um, the whole financial landscape. Uh, we've done a lot of work with Gold Standard, which is why we're delighted to have Owen with us today around the methodologies. And I'm sure that will come up in some of the discussions around the most recent metered methodologies that we've um, uh, worked on with, with uh, Gold Standard and with Climate Impact Partners. Um, and um, most recently, we're, del we're delighted to put out a call for some uh, work to be done with us on on the current state of the voluntary carbon markets and Hilda and her, her um, uh, colleagues were successful in the bid for that piece of work and have produced an amazing uh, report that we're really really excited by and that's what we're going to hear about um, this afternoon so um, or this morning depending on, on on where you are so Hilda without any further ado I'm going to hand over to you I think you're going to um, uh, run the presentation from where you are um, so over to you and uh, really looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you, Hilda. Thank you, Ed. What a lovely introduction. Let me just share my slides. Um, one moment. Okay, so thank you very much. I'm very glad to be here today. So um, for all of you that are here today, I'm sure that the big question on all of your minds is what does the voluntary carbon market hold in store for the clean cooking industry? Um, obviously, nobody has a crystal ball to be able to tell us that, but what we can do is take stock of the trends that are influencing the direction of the voluntary carbon market today and how these are likely to impact the carbon finance that is flowing to the clean cooking industry. That's exactly what I plan to walk you through over the next half hour. We have a lovely group of panelists as well, so I'm really looking forward to hearing what they have to say and have their reflections on that very topic. So um, how am I going to use this next half hour? So first, we're going to go through the financing gap. 
I'm then going to walk you through the project pipeline for clean cooking. Um, I will stress that as we um, go through this. We're then going to look at some of the trends around the push for quality in the voluntary carbon market, reflect on the impacts of the Paris rule book, and close with some conclusions before handing over to the panel who will also be reflecting on some of the issues that are discussed here. So almost half of the global population, sadly, is still without access to modern energy cooking services. It's estimated that we need 10 billion US dollars annually to achieve universal access to clean cooking by 2030. But finance flows over the past decade have only reached 2% of this. Now, carbon markets can be and have been a key tool in scaling up finance to the clean cooking industry, but it is just one source of finance. Um, and since it's used to generate carbon credits, it comes with its own set of complexities, which we will talk about later on. But nevertheless, it does help to lower investment risks. It also lowers the price of technologies and fuels for consumers. And it also has helped to enable companies to more quickly scale their operations. So what does the Clean Cooking Carbon Project Pipeline actually look like today? So on the left here, you will see this. I think it's on the left of your screen, the number of projects. On the right is the historical issuances. Um, now, in this piece of work, we've really focused on the clean cooking segment of the market, and that has made this a bit unique in terms of uh, the carbon market perspective, where usually, because improved efficiency technologies account for most of the projects and the issuances, the narrative often captures both of these um, slightly different project types. Um, so we looked at, as Ed mentioned in the introduction, you know, just to give some examples there, we look at solar and electric cookers, LPG, domestic biogas, ethanol. These are some of the technologies that are in the um, cooking and carbon market now. And we can see that uh, clean cooking accounts for around a quarter of the projects registered and around a quarter of issuances as well. Um, nearly all of the projects that are clean cooking projects are certified by the gold standard. And most of the carbon market for clean cooking is from domestic biogas. Um, and well, I will show you where those, those are located later, um, but most of them are located in a very small geographic area. Um, if we look at issuances from the clean uh, cooking technologies, we can see that most of the issuances is occurring from improved efficiency technologies, that the growth in issuances from clean cooking fuels have been much more moderate, and that's this blue bars in this graph you can see here, um, but they are still remaining steady. Um, interestingly, just five countries, though, are responsible for 95% of global issuances from clean cooking. And this map might come as a bit of a surprise to you, um, but those five countries are China, Nepal, India, Vietnam, and Cambodia. And together, they do account for 95% of global issuances from the clean cooking sector. So you can see that the um, there's quite a uh, very little geographic representation from sub-Saharan African countries, which are much more um, heavily represented in the approved efficiency side of the carbon market. Um, of course, what's important is to also consider how much finance is actually reaching the clean cooking market. Now, when it comes to price, carbon markets are quite intransparent, so it is not straightforward to estimate this. But there are basically two ways that you can estimate the aggregate finance flows. One is to look at the volume of carbon credits that have been issued, and the other is to look at the credits that have been retired. And here, what we're looking at is the finance that's actually reached 
the market, as in um, that's actually reached uh, companies and programs are operating on the ground. Um, so if we look just at retired credits, just to explain the difference between those two. So retired credits are credits that are actually taken off the market and we can therefore be fairly certain that um, that, that finance has actually reached the ground. Um, issued credits though, doesn't always mean that those credits have yet been sold and bought. So they could be held and transacted only in future. Um, so based on that, we estimate that somewhere between 40 and 105 million in aggregate carbon income has reached the clean cooking market since its inception. So since 2013, and you can also see in this graph that most of that has been from 2019 to date. Um, so one really key trend that we see happening in the voluntary carbon markets today that for sure you have not missed um, is the real push for quality. So the longevity of voluntary carbon markets really depends on the financial and the reputational benefits that they bring to buyers that are engaging in the market. So voluntary carbon markets aren't linked to any kind of stable driver of compliance demand. So really building and maintaining confidence in that market is essential to drive continued flow of carbon finance. Um, now, there are several quality initiatives that have emerged, which can very broadly be uh, segregated into supply side initiatives and demand side initiatives. So supply side initiatives are looking at setting requirements or criteria around the type of carbon credit that's generated. What are the requirements that that credit um, should uh, meet? Um, and demand side initiatives are kind of setting a bar for the type of carbon credits that can be bought and the claims that can be made around them. So on the supply side, there is the ICVCM's core carbon principles, which aim to define what a high quality carbon credit is. And there are also a number of carbon credit ratings agencies that have emerged over the last two years or so. What is interesting is that when it comes to the kind of criteria that they look at for clean cooking, um, whilst the methodologies behind each of those agencies does differ, they do tend to be quite aligned with what they would consider to be quality for um, the clean and efficient coastal sector. So that's quite interesting. Um, on the demand side, there is ECAO's Corsia, um, which again sets a bar for the type of carbon credits that buyers would be demanding. There is also the Voluntary Carbon Markets Initiative Claims Code of Practice, um, which kind of uh, provides guidelines for companies around the type of claims that they can be making around those credits. And there is an emerging uh, potential um, opportunity uh, which also sets could be setting a bar for the type of credits that could be demanded and that's through SBTI's Beyond Value Chain Mitigation. SBTI is a um, organization which are companies that aim to have net zero targets sign up to and they could engage in Beyond Value Chain Mitigation um, which could be an opportunity for clean cooking uh, project types but that's very much emerging and there's no um, you know there's no clear signal on how that might play out for this segment of the market. There is also the Clean Cooking and Climate Consortium, which is led by the Clean Cooking Alliance. And this kind of falls across the two sides. So they're on the one side looking at methodologies. So that's the supply side. But they're also looking at um, companies, uh, sorry, countries and their NDCs. Um, and advising them on how to kind of look for quality in the market. So it kind of goes across um, sides. So how will these integrity initiatives be likely to influence the clean cooking carbon market? One thing that is quite likely is that the carbon credit rating agencies will influence buyers' appetite for certain credits. Um, that's because buyers are 
likely to be quite risk averse at the moment. Um, there's a lot of media attention around carbon markets now, many of which are naming specific companies as well. Um, so buyers will be looking for what is a good project and try to seek those out. Um, we also see that the attention to quality might influence the choices made around how to quantify certain emissions reductions. So, you know, if a buyer is demanding or looking for or sending signals to the market of a certain attribute they're looking for, um, then that might also influence how emission reductions, uh, some of the uh, assumptions that are made around those. Um, and that also these initiatives are already now triggering updates in the rules and requirements that carbon standards set um, in an effort to safeguard environmental integrity. There, I would also like to say that the, the process of improvement is something that, you know, occurs in the carbon market and the continuous methodologies are always updated and rules and requirements are always updated. So it's not that these initiatives have um, pushed those changes to happen, but they um, they were already happening, but they they are already, um, I guess, kind of highlighting maybe areas where there is um, room for improvement. Um, of course, this conversation would not be complete without looking at the Paris Agreement. So we have entered a new era of climate action under the Paris Agreement. Um, that's because it has fundamentally changed our international climate architecture because every country needs to communicate their mitigation actions and enhance their ambition over time. This is rather than only having high emitting countries do this, which is what occurred under the Kyoto Protocol. So basically parties can cooperate to achieve emission reductions. Um, that allows one country to finance a mitigation action and claim that to achieve their own climate goals. Uh, each party that is engaged in that transaction adjusts their own emissions inventory up or down in what's called a corresponding adjustment. Um, now, it's up to parties to decide whether corresponding adjustments should be applied to non-authorized transactions in the voluntary carbon market. And this hasn't yet been decided, but there's basically two arguments. So um, one argument, one line of argumentation states that corresponding adjustments should be applied to voluntary carbon market credit transactions to avoid double counting and double claiming. And another argumentation states that they shouldn't be applied because it could stifle the carbon, the voluntary carbon market, and it anyways isn't relevant if the sector doesn't um, appear in the host country's emissions inventory, which might be the case for the clean cooking sector because um, it's related to land use and it's um, complicated to ensure that you have an inventory that's strong enough to show um, those emission reductions. Um, governments, though, are free to determine the rules for how they would consider voluntary carbon market transactions. So parties will, one party will have one approach and another will have another approach. And we can already see that. So different countries are having different approaches. Um, and some are also uh, holding back to wait to see how this conversation develops before they make an informed choice. So under the scenario that they decide that corresponding adjustments are not required for voluntary carbon market uh, transactions, that would allow the market to operate much as it has to date. It could though lead to double counting if the sector is visible in the inventory of the host country. Um, and buyers may not be able to make claims of carbon neutrality and the credits wouldn't be eligible for any compliance schemes like Corsia, which have stated that they do require corresponding adjustments. In the scenario that corresponding adjustments are required, um, that could result in quite a significant delay for carbon revenues being delivered to projects and it could increase issuance costs. The reasons for those two is because host countries need to first put in place, and buying countries, of course, uh, the architecture 
that they need to have in place to actually make a corresponding adjustment and to adjust their own greenhouse gas inventory. And that's quite an undertaking. Um, it could also risk limiting the host country's ability to meet its own NDC if the clean cooking sector isn't visible in its greenhouse gas inventory. Carbon standards uh, position on this. So the gold standard will continue to issue the ERs regardless of whether the host country has authorized the ERs under Article 6. And corresponding adjustments, though, will be required for the VERs, those are the carbon credits from the gold standard, um, to be issued towards a buying country's NDC or for compliance obligations under Corsia. VERA will also continue to issue the ERs regardless of whether the host country has authorized the ERs under Article 6, um, but must be notified if a country applies a corresponding adjustment related to credits. So what does this mean as the outlook for clean cooking and carbon markets? Here we look at based on the projects which are already registered and listed. You can see here that improved cooking is continuing to dominate the market. Um, it's actually one of the fastest growing sectors in the voluntary carbon market with 344 new projects listed. Clean cooking is looking more moderate with 43 projects listed um, and also a smaller volume of issuances. Um, but I will note that more clean cooking projects will and also are entering the pipeline, notably under the new gold standards metered methodology for electric appliances, where several programs are now seeking certification. And it is quite exciting that the development of that methodology has really been an enabler for carbon financing to support electric cooking. Um, if we look here at how issuances are likely to uh, look going forward, so this graph is based on programs that are already registered and listed. Um, on the left, you can see uh, current issuances, and on the right in dark blue is the future projection. And you can see here that domestic biogas is likely to continue to dominate. Um, I'd also like to point out that issuances drop here, but that's very much uh, towards the, the end of the years, but that's very much because programs currently registered to come to the end of their crediting periods. It's actually likely that because new programs will be joining, that that isn't likely to drop, but it will continue up. But this is just purely looking at modeling based on the current pipeline. <clears throat> Um, how much carbon finance is likely to reach the clean cooking market? Um, so here we modeled this based on the current pipeline only of listed and registered projects and using two different pricing scenarios, one being that the carbon price reaches 25 US dollars by 2030, the second being that it reaches $50 by 2030. And based on that, um, we do estimate that somewhere between 450 and 800 million in future carbon finance income is likely to reach the clean cooking market. That's aggregate amounts between 2023 and 2030. So in conclusion, we see that the voluntary carbon market does find itself at a bit of a turning point. Um, as I mentioned earlier, without a stable source of compliance demand, the market really depends on a positive reputation to foster growth. It will be the market's ability to retain that investor and buyer confidence combined with clarity on the impact of the Paris Agreement that's ultimately likely to shape its future. Um, we also see that um, increasing the demand, that an increasingly demanding carbon market is likely to require strengthening the approaches to determining climate impact. 
um, and that carbon projects that adopt more conservative or more accurate greenhouse gas accounting approaches are likely to be sought after. This is another opportunity for clean cooking project types because they can often, in terms of accuracy, demonstrate uh, fuel use in terms of uh, purchase receipts or can also demonstrate fuel use based on the amount of electricity used, um, which is much easier to track and trace than improved efficiency uh, programs. And we also see that the Paris Agreement rulebook, of course, is likely to significantly impact the voluntary carbon market, and it's important to follow closely the developments in the countries that you operate in. Thank you very much. Hilda, that's fantastic. Thank you ever so much. Um, uh, fascinating. Um, I think the other amazing thing is that actually you're 10 minutes under length. Um, so that gives us 10 minutes extra for the discussion. And actually, I'm going to throw something at my panel uh, in, a, in a moment. So a word of warning to the panel. I'm going to get you each to introduce yourselves in a moment. But uh, when I do that, I'd like you to maybe just take one thing from the talk that you uh, uh, were struck by or uh, that you want to raise as a question, just like in a minute, anything that occurs to you as you introduce yourself, just an initial reaction to uh, what Hilda's um, had to say. So you're now all wondering and worrying who I'm going to choose first now for this, but um, I think actually I'm going to go to Annalise, please. If you could introduce yourself and then just an initial one minute re reaction. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, um, everyone, for organizing this and Hilda for uh, carrying the mic for, for us. Um, but uh, I'm Annalise. I'm a uh, fourth year PhD candidate um, at the University of California, Berkeley in the Energy and Resources Group. Um, but uh, I mostly study household energy access um, in low and middle income countries. Um, but specifically, I've been working on an over and under crediting analysis of um, cook stove methodologies on the uh, voluntary carbon market. Um, and I guess I my one minute reaction to the presentation um, is that I am extremely excited um, to have all of the subject matter experts on this panel um, and this push for um, for quality and the there seems to be a lot of energy going towards this, which is extremely exciting um, because, you know, my uh, as a researcher, I, I don't want to just, uh, you know, identify issues in the field, but also outline, um, at least from, from my and my co-authors perspective of what the best path forward is, but then also to collaborate um, in these settings to uh, to actually implement those. Um, and then my second half of my 30 seconds, um, <laughs> I will say, sorry, really quickly, um, that the number that I just wanted to say that is really also striking with this group for modern energy cooking services is that um, the effects of polluting or transitional fuels um, is 1.4 trillion a year. So, you know, net, it's not benefit for us to spend that 10 billion every year um, at using uh, clean and, and max, uh, you know, modern energy cooking services. Um, so it's really also important for for that aspect as well as my takeaway. Annalise, thank you very much. Uh, typical academic getting in there with the two points there. Where <laughs> that's gonna... um, Matt, uh, over to you next, please, if you'd like to introduce yourself and make an initial comment. Is that a segue from Typical academic. Thanks very much. Oh, hang on. We've got uh, two. <laughs> we've got two mats actually. I was actually looking at the other one. Oh, so that's the oh, other I'm one. So the sorry. academic assumed that he was the one that was being. <laughs> that's my I'll fault. Matt, that's I'll my fault. Matt, Matt Evans. Matt, oh. Matt Evans. Oh, it's my fault. I'm really sorry, both of you. <laughs> Matt Evans. Yeah, happily. So, so my name is Matt Evans. Uh, I'm the, the director of investments at Environmental Commodity Partners. We are an investor in in broadly emission reductions around the world, and and have done cook stove projects in addition to other types of investments that we make. Um, and maybe my double point will be I'm I'm also on the board, um, and and have spent 15 years involved in broadly um, clean cooking, and and I'm on the board of Up Energy, which is a, a company that also develops uh, cook stove projects uh, that that generate revenue from from selling carbon reductions and issued the first electric cooking credits recently. So it's a company that's very, very committed and excited about the the possibility of of the cleanest technologies out there. Um, and and 
question. I think, um, you know, it's it is very interesting. Like I, I can speaking as an investor, um, you know, really kind of see buyers pulling back from from the cook stove space. And ultimately, that makes it hard for us to place capital, obviously. So, you know, different kind of a, a sense of, of like the direction here versus what we see on the ground is there, there's something of an interesting gap that'll be interesting to discuss. Well, that's brilliant. Thank you for uh, for raising that. Um, I'm going to go to actually let's go to the other Matt. Um, so that's what that's what happened before. Matt, please um, your your your, your you. reactions, please. Thank you very much. Yeah, so I'm uh, I'm Matthew Leach. I'm a long-standing kind of academic in in sustainability and energy in, in the UK. Uh, but I've been involved in the MEX program since it started what some four and a half years ago, uh, where I do work on the costs and the impacts broadly of modern energy cooking, particularly electric cooking. Um, and then in the last little while, I've been helping uh, the kind of refinement of the uh, the, the metered and measured um, uh, cooking methodology with gold standard. So yeah, my uh, I guess my observation is, you know, I was really struck when Hilda and her team first produced the results showing the um, the kind of current balance or the the, the recent balance of, of where credits uh, go, where issuances go, which technologies, and then also which geographic locations. And in fact, you know, I was, I was, I was part of helping commission this piece of work. And when we first saw those numbers come through, showing that really sub-Saharan Africa really didn't feature in that top five, and uh, it was almost all about biogas, you know, we actually kind of almost pushed back against those numbers and said, you sure, really? <laughs> because our, our, our world is largely around sub-Saharan Africa and, and other parts of, of Southeast Asia, and, and it's more around LPG, electric cooking, and, and so on, and they just didn't really feature. The positive I take from it is the enormous, therefore, headroom that there is as these new technologies and previously rather some ways neglected uh, places where where you know clean cooking just just is really a, a minor a, a minor thing so far the headroom that exists within potentially these markets to uh, to, to really develop notwithstanding other Matt's comment they just made about uh, about the difficulties perhaps of, of accessing that for clean cooking going forwards but we'll come on to that in the panel I'm sure Matt thank you very much uh, I'm now going to turn to Faisal Yeah, uh, so I'm Faisal Hussain. I'm the Senior Director for Innovative Finance for Clean Cooking Alliance. Um, uh, my basic job is to try and figure out how we can unlock capital for clean cooking. So that's my obsession. Um, uh, and by the way, Hilda and Max, you know, really great study. I'm just so glad Hilda's now working with us as well. Um, so, uh, <laughs> so it's slightly incestuous, but um, uh, you know, the two things I was really struck with and similar to uh, Matt, that I, I the, the country spread is just quite remarkable because I think all of us kind of think about Kenya and, and you know, Ghana and East Africa being the kind of key place, right? So that was a surprise, surprise to see Nepal so high on the agenda. I, I just wouldn't have figured. Uh, the other, I suppose it's a question, which is although biogas is, sort of placed as part of the sort of clean cooking, but, you know, probably a very small part of biogas goes into cooking, whereas a fairly large chunk goes elsewhere. So, you know, I, I it would be interesting to kind of hear about how that sort of sliced and spiced um, and what that means for the even the modern cooking is even less potentially than than we assume from the from the data. You've just depressed us even further, Faisal. <laughs> In terms of that, that's that's great. Um, Owen, uh, last but not least, over to Owen. Yeah, thanks, Ed. Hi, everyone. Um, Owen Hewlett, the Chief Technical Officer at the Gold Standard Foundation and, and sort of tangentially relevant, also sit on the Technical Council of Science-Based Targets. And yeah, I mean, lots of, lots of interesting takeaways, I guess, um, maybe to sort of frame some of the issues that come out of it. You know, we if, if our big sort of scary goal is the goals of the Paris Agreement and we can't achieve that unless companies take responsibility for their ongoing emissions, it's impossible. And we also can't achieve it unless we resolve the clean cooking crisis. Right. You can't. Those two things you know, are unnecessary inputs to that output. And um, that makes it an, an, an a really exciting opportunity in the sense that one of the reasons why the ratio of people cooking on open fires doesn't change hasn't changed for 45 years is that 
it's very difficult to regulate how people cook and it's not in anybody's value chain um, and it's not an especially inherently profitable activity. So as a source of finance, you know, the act has to happen. The thing needs to be resolved and the finance is free to finance whatever it likes. So it's it's kind of perfect. It's a perfect opportunity. But the challenge that it comes with is that you have this, I call it a squishiness ratio problem. So the voluntary carbon market carbon credits are used for offsetting the way companies take responsibility traditionally has been to offset their emissions. And that's a very hard binary. You did or did not offset. You are or are not carbon neutral, setting aside whether you believe that's possible or not. You know, it's an unforgiving claim, which is a hostage to fortune then to the instrument that serves it. But the instrument that serves it is not a hard binary, right? Any carbon credit is probabilities of additionality and estimates of reduction. And that is especially difficult, as we all know, as practitioners and academics, especially difficult in clean cooking, probably as hard as it, I can't think of a harder project type to, to get right in that sense. So you have this really major squishiness problem set against you know the one type of activity that this is sort of meant for. Um, and that's kind of, we, you know, that's where we are. That's the, that's the, the 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 moment on the precipice can we decide how to adjust that squishiness ratio oh and that's brilliant thank you um hilda there's a, a lot of different issues immediately re re reacted to there um can i give you a, an opportunity just to reflect on which however many of them you wish to reflect on briefly before we then move into the the discussion hilda over to you yeah absolutely thank you um First, uh, Owen, thank you for mentioning this the squishiness issue. I think that's a big that's a nice way to put it because it's easy to remember. But also, um, it's a really good point, and you're totally right that also this is like one of the one sectors that you know when the carbon markets were emerging, right? This was like the the example of what it's intended to do, so to bring finance to um, individuals that need it most, and to use this kind of innovative innovative financing structure to be able to do that. Um, and I think that's really important to think about in this this context of this whole discussion is really how how can we how can we in essence actually get more finance to the clean cooking sector that needs it so much and that you know it's awful that yeah anyways that needs to be so thank you for bringing that up that's one initial reaction um, other reaction on the map of where programs are located was also a surprise for us and it also makes me think that probably having more analysis looking really at the clean cooking segment of carbon markets would be quite helpful um, a lot of the well almost all the literature in fact um, really looks at mixing the narrative of improved and clean cooking um, which makes it a bit difficult to actually see like, OK, if we're really talking about the clean cooking segment of the market, what are we actually talking about? And what are the characteristics that are unique to that segment of the market? And, and what does that mean? Um, so that's something for, for future work that I think would be actually helpful for, for the market and, and also for buyers that are looking to engage in the market. You know, what are the attributes of those programs that maybe are, are different? Um, and um yes and now i forgot my other point i want to react to another point that faisal made ah domestic biogas yes um on domestic biogas um so in our analysis this really focuses on domestic but so it doesn't look at all other um other use of biogas it's it's um literally farmers that are using their animal manure to feed into a small scale domestic digester so that's usually something between six and 12 square meters and the gas is just used for domestic cooking so it is firmly in the clean cooking part of the market no i feel less depressed than i did which is uh, <laughs> which is great um thank you very much all of you i think that's a really nice introduction to the the, the various themes that came up through through um hilda's presentation uh, we're now going to move into a panel discussion as manny's just said on the chat we really welcome people to get involved uh, and to ask uh, questions which i will then put to the panel in in the chat as we as we move forward so please do please do um put your questions in there and also please you know if there are people on on the call that have no background in this topic whatsoever and you're sat there thinking what 
on earth are these people talking about? Then don't, there, there is no question that is too simple or, or you think that's, that everyone else understands because you can be sure that there will be at least 10 other people that will be sitting there thinking, thank God someone asked that question because I don't know what they're talking about either. So just being aware of, of that, that's great. Um, so uh, I've got some, we have some pre-prepared questions um, and uh, luckily, um, well, or intentionally, they build on some of the things that we've just been talking about. Um, and I wanted us to move first of all to the uh, the Paris Agreement and where things are moving. I think it's absolutely crucial, as, we, as we've already heard, to the, the likely future of the, of the market. So on the one hand, we have uh, optimism that there might be higher prices from government donors. Um, and on the other hand, and there could be limitations on access to those finances from project developers uh, if it becomes part of the the um, the, the the national re regime itself. So, given that, what do you think is going to happen to the voluntary carbon market going forward, and what, where do you see the the markets already moving? Um, Faisal, I'm going to go to you first on this one. Yeah, um, thanks, Ed. Uh, I think I just want to start slightly earlier that. For us, um, VCM has really clearly been one of the biggest driver of growth of the clean cooking markets. And that's really important because that's just enabled compared to grants and other sort of lack of financing for a lot of companies to achieve viability quicker and become profitable. And that's just important from the supply side that lots of people, millions of people can then start transitioning to cleaner fuels and cleaner lives. So to us, at least, that anything in relation to how a uh, Paris Agreement affects VCM per se is not really interesting, but it's how it affects in relation to the continued or sustained finance moving into the sector and growing it. So that's really the central question that we keep asking ourselves as we kind of think about Paris. Um, so for me, I think the it's a good question, how might it affect? I mean, the simple answer is actually none of us quite know. Uh, but we can make guesses about what could happen. Uh, and I think what we're probably clear about is that is more on the longer term rather than the short term. So for the longer term, we can speculate that some of the uh, standards and sort of move towards quality will just drive and pull the voluntary carbon markets in that direction and therefore prices uh, uh, that we see because uh, buyers will be much more confident going forward. I think what we will probably see is the widening of benefit of carbon revenue beyond households and corporates to include local communities and developing countries through flowbacks for adaptation financing, which I think we've not done enough. Um, and I think, and some of you will probably raise your eyebrows given what happened in Zimbabwe uh, recently, <laughs> Um, that there will be much more certainty and transparency, right? So as countries bed down, create regular legislation, create the infrastructure, whatever short-term worries that we might have, that will benefit everybody, all the voluntary markets and so on uh, in that process. The, the worry I think we probably, many of us have, is what happens in between that road to Jerusalem uh, and now. Right. So what what's the pain that we might see? So for us, at least, there's probably two really major ones that kind of is worrisome and that we have to manage. Uh, the first is, you know, will the requirements of I mean, uh, will the requirements of Article six. Be so high and create entry barriers for uh, the voluntary market or impose a level of costs. Uh, of doing business that we just basically price out investors and companies from the market, right? Um, and quite what that scale might be, none of us know, but that's something that is definitely a, a worrisome issue. The second is, might we end up seeing a two-tier voluntary market system? One that's sort of high quality credits with higher prices aligned with the Paris Agreement regime, and another that are sort of lower quality, lower prices that sit outside. Right. And what do we think about that and how do we um, sort of make sense of it? Um, and 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 I think I don't know. I mean, I would love to kind of hear about. I think this may be an issue that Matt raised earlier as well, that if we look at some of the companies that are doing really well in terms of quality, they actually went through a maturity process of probably not 
a lot of quality. And then gradually, as they got better, they they got there. So how do we bring together those insights of the journey that companies go through uh, so that we allow markets to evolve while we retain a really strong commitment and drive towards quality? So I think those are kind of key issues that we've got to sort out. And I think, uh, I mean, those are sort of meta level issues. I think for us, what we've got to try and do is to think about how we support the governments to think about uh, some of the issues around whether they have clean cooking in NDCs, whether there's corresponding adjustments, what the impact might be. So, for example, as a strategy, you know, you could arguably see countries saying, OK, we're going to allow um, sort of sale and adjustments for clean cooking because it's sort of has the sort of lowest marginal abatement cost. And therefore, for us to kind of regain that, uh, will be much quicker, less expensive, or they could say, well, actually, we want to kind of go for the sort of highest marginal cost uh, sectors because that will carry premium prices and we can get more money from. from so, so there are questions that countries will kind of think about, and we've got to figure out how we help the countries and almost create a transitional process that allow uh, sort of development of legislation and so on so that it's not necessarily a hard break or sort of hard kind of situation that we might see in the market. Um, and what we've got to try and absolutely do is not to end up with a clean cooking market that's highly concentrated with three or four or five companies in a few countries, but a market that's that's much more sort of competitive and open with many players playing. Uh, so how do we balance what we want to do as a market requirement with what might be uh, potentially some of the sort of shorter term impacts in terms of the alignment with voluntary carbon market and and uh, the Paris regime. Faisal, thank you very much. That's a that's a really clear, uh, 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 interesting response to that. Um, Matt uh, Evans, says he quickly. <laughs> um, uh, Faisal mentioned that you'd already kind of touched on this as well. I, I wonder fr from a from a I guess from a company perspective, particularly with your involvement in Up Energy, what's what's your take on this issue? Um. With with respect to Paris and and kind of directionally going forward, what what kind of support will come from Paris? I think that well, it, it's hard. I, I'm really kind of coming from the blended view as an investor in other cookstove projects um, here in Africa, and also the the kind of up energy view that I that I get as a board member. I think that um, you know what what we've seen broadly in the complex is prices really come down right in the last let's just say six months um and and like one interesting example is that up energy issued the first electric credits had sold before kind of the the negative cycle i would say you know the half of those credits at 52 dollars we've seen prices come up energy has seen prices uh for you know any credit and and this is what we see at acp come down by about 40 percent um and we've seen the same thing about electric on on our electric credits right so there's there is a correlation, right, between the cleanest, like the value of the cleanest credits versus the value of of, of what we would call, and, and and interestingly, like there's a question of quality, but really all like the the quality of all cookstove credits has been, you know, really subject to to question, even metered devices, right? So like, it's across the board, um, and and what we've seen on the Article Six side, and this is speaking as an investor more than as a as a you know the developer because I have less of a window, is you know we've seen more concern on behalf of of different countries basically of the buyer countries to to value climate contributions of cookstore projects in general including electric cooking um and ecp is considering an investment in an electric cooking project and and we've seen that really come off um and and so almost out of out of viability at this point so you know it'll be really interesting to see how how kind of things go forward um but but i think it's it's all these questions are really good and we want to focus on how do we kind of give the space the this the assurance that it needs to to bring in the buyers so that investors can get involved yeah definitely thank you matt um and maybe we could just kind of take that issue head on a, li a little bit more before we move on to hopefully kind of like more what do we do about it but i best the, the question is you know there have been these persistent reports of overclaiming on it on a on existing um voluntary carbon market credits uh and 
this is included uh, it's not only clean cooking it's got a lot a lot is to do with forestry and and so on but clean cooking has been implicated in this um we know Annalise that you, that you've been uh, the lead author on a, on a recent piece that's been that's been uh, that you've produced with 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 colleagues um and i wondered from your work what do you think that that is justified and also what steps do you think are needed to restore buyers confidence in in not only the the um the the uh, uh, I guess the more traditional clean cooking projects, but also, as Matt's saying, it's affecting the higher tier um, uh, uh, alternatives as well. So I wondered if you could give us a little overview on that. On that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, and I, I do want to start before I go in just saying that what you said um, to reiterate that it isn't a cook stove problem. And so definitely in our messaging, we wanted to also um, uh, to, to really stress that. So it, it's, you know, cook stoves are amazing projects. And so we want to um, continue the funding there, but also to improve the quality. Um, so for, you know, is the level of overcrediting um, justified? Um, and so I, I think that our, our piece really systematically goes through um, every single issue. And, and what I see is a, um, you know, fair and thorough review of the current literature on comparing where the methodologies are and the flexibility and then kind of what the research and the state of science says. And when there is uncertainty or, um, you know, a lack of research, we do pull back. Um, for instance, you know, our quantitative reviews for additionality um, and leakage um, and uh, in the newest uh, version that's out for review that the preprint isn't released yet, but um, it is out for review. We we pull back on non-permanence and on overlapping claims as well because in in our review in our work the research wasn't there. But in the places where we really systematically went through and reviewed and we found you know ranges that were not only you know where we couldn't be as accurate um, and we note the limitations. Uh, we replace bounds, you know, we also kind of pursue a, a Monte Carlo analysis, which allows for this uncertainty. Um, so when we can't be completely accurate, we, we attempt to be conservative. Um, and so, you know, I could get in the weeds, but from a high level, um, you know, I, I know the online methods is a really long document, but um, I, you know, and I'm happy to talk about a specific issue um, and get into the weeds, but from a high level, um, we do feel that it was justified and thorough and also um, conservative when we weren't, you know, fair in that sense of, of conservative when, when there isn't the, the science and we know areas that are in need of future research. And we've also acquired some funding to pursue more research um, to, to kind of obtain the level of, um, I mean, we'll never have 100% certainty, but the level of confidence um, that we would be to, to publish something publicly like that. Um, so I guess that is my, uh, you know, is it is that level of overcrediting justified? Um, that's my response. But then what to do about it? Um, you know, I think that we um, and we are really open and want to work with um, collaborators and project developers to see um, and the standards to see the changes that need to be made. And so we outlined what we saw from our research as the most clear ways to either be accurate or to then be conservative, because we do recognize that, you know, implementing the level of robust monitoring, for instance, in that category is is um, onerous on the on the on the project developers. And so in that case, then, though, if we can't be as accurate, then we need to be more conservative. Um, so we saw aspects and largely we really try to focus on how the methodologies can can change and to a lot of times they have changed and there have been great improvements, but also limiting or requiring best practices. Um, for instance, like gold standard has a lot of really great insights, but sometimes they're not required. Um, and so that uh, we saw uh, areas in that sense where, where there is tangible um, and like feasible changes that can be made to improve quality. Annalise, brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, Matt, as in Matt Leach, um, I know that you've been engaging with Annalise and her colleagues on the on the uh, the methodology. Um, same question to you, really. Um, what, do you have anything further to add to what Annalise has said? 
Yeah, thanks. I mean, we've we've been working with Climate Impact Partners and, and Gold Standard on the development of, of this metered and measured methodology, which has been referred to a, a, a few times since since it was first thought of a couple of years ago. And we're now helping ATEC take the first uh, induction stove based project through to uh, validation and, and verification. And the intention was always with that methodology, which is inherently digital in terms of usage data. The intention was always to harness the opportunities of the digital MRV to make projects both more cost effective to reduce some of the, the, the program costs, but while doing that to improve integrity by using that real usage data. So it was brilliant, it was wonderful to see uh, Annalise and colleagues uh, kind of relatively positive assessment of that methodology in, in, in that piece of work that she's been referring to. But I mean, our ambition, I think the whole sector's ambition is, is to help refine this methodology so it's, you know, 100% accurate that it's it's not being seen to be overcrediting, you know, in in any way, as well as being simple and, and easy to employ, and and you know, the, the Berkeley paper made made a, a couple of points of critique about that metered methodology, but I would suggest that most of those need really a kind of a sector wide approach. So, for example, FNRB, the fraction of non renewable biomass that's used, um, you know, the sector as a whole needs to get to grips with what are going to be the new defaults, the new standards, the new methodologies that everybody can use and refer to, whether that's default for the whole world or for certain regions or very specific for individual places. Um, but individual methodologies can and should be continuously, I think, reviewed and, and occasionally tightened against kind of unscrupulous developers who are looking for loopholes. Um, and we're very pleased, I think, to be in a position to kind of act as a bit of a conduit for experience from developers as they're beginning to work up the first project using using this methodology and, and their consultants as they get to grips with the new processes and then kind of help liaise with gold standard about where some of those areas of potential tightening might be. So I think it's already very good, but we want to go on making it better. And if anyone's got suggestions for specifics on how to do that, I mean, talk to any of us, but but we'd be happy to to be a kind of focal point for some of that. Matt, thank you very much. Um, uh, just to note that uh, there have been quite a few questions in the in the chat. Um, Hilda, thank you very much for answering one of those questions, which was on um, what's the difference between improved cooking and clean cooking on the basis of, of, of the, the presentation. And I think as you've very clearly showed, uh, improved cooking is improving the efficiency of cooking utilising existing fuels. So in which case, mainly we're talking here of improved cook stoves, biomass. Um, and then on the other hand, clean cooking is an actual transition to a cleaner fuel like LPG, biogas, ethanol, solar, electric, and so on. So that's the, the distinction between those two in the data that was, was presented. So what we're focusing on here is, as I said at the beginning, our particular interest is in the cleaner sector, or often we refer to it as modern energy energy cooking, in the, in, in, as in the name of the, of the, um, of the program. Um, the other thing, um, Danson, just in terms of the, um, you ask about whether briquettes and pellets could be considered for CDM registration, we're Dealing, that's part of the the formal um, involuntary, as you might put it, mar market. So it's different to the the carbon market that we're talking about here. But Hilda, could you just say a word on where briquettes and pellets fit into that kind of distinction that you made between improved and and clean? Yeah, sure. Um, so um, the certainly to answer your question also uh briquettes and pellets definitely are uh eligible for carbon crediting um as there's there's methodologies for that um in terms of where they fit in the clean versus improved it also depends it's a nuanced answer that's why i say it's mostly about fuel switching but it's a nuanced answer because it depends on the uh i guess the efficiency or how um how well the stove is able to burn the pellets or the briquettes. Um, you know, so if it's very um, high tech and fan assisted and does that very well, it can be a clean, it can fall into the clean category. Um, if less so, it falls in the um, improved efficiency category. So Hilda, thank you very much. That's brilliant. Okay. Um, we're going to now move on, uh, and I think we'll try and keep the responses to this relatively short. We, we still have half an hour or so, but I want to make sure that we get a chance for, for quest other questions from the floor as well. As well. Um, so these are the two 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 questions. One, one is uh, around the use of digital technology. The other of where, uh, is around the 
uh, movement into other SDG impacts. So starting with uh, digital technology, um, Owen, um, uh, there, there's increasing interest in using digital technology as a way of addressing this integrity issue. So it can also help to reduce transaction costs, improve disbursement lead times and so on. Is this something that Gold Standard is considering and what's your kind of perspective on the digitalization of this whole process? Yeah, and I, I would say there's probably, I mean, just for the sake of conciseness, there's probably two levels to it. There's the way we conduct MRV of the actual monitoring reporting verification of the activities themselves and in the clean cooking space, you know, that could be temperature sensors on the stove to replace, you know, manual survey and measurement, for example, and take the human error element out of it. Um, and, you know, those are very promising, but not always, you know, very cost effective and not always very accessible. So, you know, those can be a challenge. Obviously, the MEX methodology comes with its own sort of inherent opportunity for that kind of technology and monitoring. And that's really where the, the kind of improvement of um, accuracy can come from. Um, and so, yes, very promising. We have a, a pilot phase coming up where proposals for testing what we call D digital MRV um, uh, approaches and how we adjust methods, because something to think about is those tools aren't necessarily available to everybody, especially in a space like clean cooking. So how do we make sure we keep the analog version as well as the digital version and, and you know, not devalue one just because it didn't have access to a technology that somebody wealthier does? So we have to be super careful with that conversation. It's more than just an accuracy question. It's also a moral question. Um, and then at the other end of the scale, there's the process of certification and issuance. And there, um, we we look we've looked extensively at how you use those digital technologies for monitoring, coupled with um, improved assessment approaches. So thinking about how can we, for example, calibrate the auditor's approach so that let's say parameter A should come between X and Y according to all data and research. How can we automatically check that from the uploads from some of these sensors or from the MEX technologies? And you know how can that be assessed remotely so you don't have to check it again on site? And if it comes between X and Y, and the auditor's remotely happy, then you know great, let's let's move on from that. If it comes in at Z, then let's ask a question. Um, and and that's kind of getting towards what you said, Ed, around how you move from this slow process of issuance to a quicker one. So right now, most projects probably monitor for three years. They get audited, they have their credits issued, and their earliest credits are already three years old and, and worth less. Um, actually, you know, if we could move to real time is probably ambitious in clean cooking, but even if you could get to quarterly, six monthly, right, that you have this, you know, fresh is a strange word for a carbon credit, but these kind of fresh credits getting issued uh, at their highest possible value and uh, and availability to investors and to, to project developers, then that's where technology can help. So yeah, we've got a lot of work going on in that space as well. We have two initiatives that are worth checking out, the open collaboration with the IOTA Foundation and Climate Check. Um, uh, supported by google.org and we have the climate ledger initiative which is a long-running thing 10 nearly 10 years now where we've looked at um, thought leadership around the use of technology brilliant thank you Owen. i'm, I'm going to pass to, to matt leach in a minute to, to potentially add to to that um i did notice though uh i feel very sorry for mark who's been super um collaborative in terms of questions being asked on the on the chat some of which have been answered and some of which haven't um i'm not going to ask the fnrb question to the panel but i am going to ask others that i know are on the call that are able to answer that question um mark is saying as a project developer should i use default values for fnrb um, and he also asks is there a price difference between improved versus clean cooking um, i think we've already answered that in that yes there is that the higher integrity and the higher levels of of, of um uh, uh, uh yeah the, the higher integrity basically you can get from the from the higher tier fuels does lead to a to, to a higher price price within the market um i guess if anyone's interested in saying a little bit more on that we we can do um the other point that mark raises is um it's a really difficult process for companies which is exactly what this issue about digitalization is supposed to do is supposed to address um but also mark raises the question is are there 
easy tools to help navigate the whole process for companies. And I think as Faisal said earlier, it's it's um it is one of the biggest impediments for companies to actually they can get put off going through the whole process because of the complexity of the process. So I think one of the things I just wanted to say is that both MEX and CCA, uh, and I'm sure others in the in the industry are, are currently working on projects designed to produce materials for companies that will make that process easier. Uh, we do recognize that is a major issue for MEX, particularly as we're working with, with electric cooking companies for, for Faisal and CCA across a whole range of different uh, um, technologies. So kind of watch this space, um, I think, is the is the, is the the answer on, on that one. Unless Faisal or Matt, you wanted to say anything more on that very quickly before I move on. Just a quick one. I mean, I'll share something on the, on the chat, but we are looking at how we can develop Subnational FNRB values, um, uh, so that that gives greater accuracy. Um, it uh, and and also sort of aligns funding to where there is greatest sort of emissions, as well as give much better visibility to investors, uh, so that they can think about where to invest and so on. I mean, right now the whole problem of national or even regional is, is a real problem. So, uh, and we want to make that into a public good. Um, so, you know, just again. What's that space? I'm just tea leafing your your words. Um, <laughs> and, uh, um, but yeah, but that's something that we need to be all working together on to sort of develop that. And that's with Rob Bayliss and, and his crew. Um, Thanks very much, Faisal. That's great. Matt, anything to add on the on the digital side? Yeah, well, I, I can't I can't replicate. Uh, I don't need to replicate what Owen has already said in terms of <laughs> kind of the way in which the overall uh, kind of ecosystem is moving, which I think is very exciting. I just wanted to kind of return to like the starting point of your question, I suppose, which is the the view that digital is is helping improve integrity, reducing costs and so on. And I just really would just sort of share uh, informal feedback, I suppose, from having worked or working with ATEC on on this first application of, of the methodology. I mean, we ought to really ask ATEC, I suppose, and, and we are doing that in more formal senses. But in terms of, of, of what the experience of using the methodology, I think it definitely has made it uh, a relatively simpler process to, uh, to to develop the project. It's definitely reduced the time and the cost needed. Now, in a first project, of course, it's taken us a bit longer to get to grips with the methodology, but but seeing through that startup time, you can definitely see that it, it's, it's streamlined the process compared to what they would have had to do for the previous versions of, of similar methodologies. Um, so the high integrity comes almost by definition because you're using you know real usage data for the for the project device rather than basing that on surveys and so on. So so I think time and cost benefits, uh, integrity benefits are, are pretty clear. But the flip side of that is high integrity almost by definition. I, I could be proved wrong on that. I suppose brings relatively slightly lower credit levels in terms of tons of carbon. You know, it's almost certainly going to leave one to be slightly more conservative or end up slightly more conservative. That should be reflected by higher prices per per ton per per credit. Um, and I think you question this, Ed. I mean, uh, mechs aren't typically in the room when those conversations about what price you're going to give me to a to a buyer um, are, are held. And so I think I need to leave it to others in the room to comment on whether we really see evidence yet that dig digitally enabled uh, methodologies are bringing those kind of or higher integrity projects are bringing those higher prices. I think we feel there are good signs for that, um, but but perhaps it's a little too early to be definitive. Brilliant. Thank you very um, much. Go on. Oh, I was going to say I'm happy to to speak to that if useful in terms yeah. of what what we I have some view from the, the developer side, but also from the investor side, what we see, and and it's and it's really quite interesting. Like I think the the kind of the way I would frame it is that that ultimately as as the ratings agencies have sort of begun to take more and more airspace in the in and be more and more followed in the space, um, it's been really helpful because it's great to see ultimately the kind of improved a conversation even about what the quality of these credits is. Um, and we also see interesting biases creep in, and, and it's a little bit counter to the sum of the narrative here, but but in the global north, there are a lot of opportunities to reduce emissions in a way that's that's much easier to meter, right? Because the baseline is already metered. Um, and so, you know, in, a, in everything that we're talking about here, and, and so we see the buyers ultimately 
really kind of implicit biases that that they re, that they have, you know, some of them to do with what's happening in low income countries, showing up differently because of that that difference. And so, um, when we when we look at uh, the way that that these projects have to happen because the baseline is not metered and there's no way around that right um for even for the metered methodology so in in that case we see the the sort of global northern mindset kicking in and actually impacting the way that that those credits are valued and and you know everything that we're talking about and really i think the last six months there's been a lot that's put out some of it very inaccurate by some of the ratings agencies that like in in academic work as well that plays right into those kind of interesting implicit biases that exist. Um, so we don't see quite the same dimension there. I think there the hope is that metered methodologies will be much more appealing, um, but it's it's only a matter of time before Calix notes that the baseline is still not metered, you know, <laughs> and so and and ultimately you know that is there is uncertainty there and that that plays into and, and fundamentally disadvantages the types of projects that low income people can benefit most from. So it is this kind of interesting tension and quality really matters. And and at the same time, it, it play the, the pursuit of it plays into like really interesting implicit global northern bias. Matt, that is that's a fascinating, uh, I think, response on that and 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 very perceptive. Um, I think one of the areas that the potentially could address that is through impact finance on other co-benefits in relation to the SDGs. See the nice link there to one of the other questions. Um, and that I think is so, um, I suppose the next question, and Matt, you were down to answer this one as well. So I'm going to keep, keep with you if I may. So are you seeing any opportunities to promote um, the, the other SDG impacts of the projects that you support and actually get some kind of impact finance from them? Or are you listing these as, as co-benefits to try and increase the payments from the carbon finance that you're looking at? Because I know there are two different approaches in terms of those, of those co-benefits. Yeah, I think I, I probably can't speak for, for, for the developer side since I'm not as involved, but, but as an investor, we are looking at projects that are thinking about, you know, how to, if there are ways to monetize the co-benefits themselves, there, there aren't good facilities for that now. There, there are some very interesting, um, like ADALI methodologies that have been tested. You know, it's, it's kind of this philanthropy, uh, experimentation philanthropy kind of valuation that, that doesn't really have the scale that, that right now carbon markets do. Um, and, and the other thing I, I would flag is that, the cook stove space is competing with an, with all of the rest of decarbonization for for value and so you know my my personal passion is how much of the value that's in those global markets can we drive towards projects that benefit low income people yeah. um and that's why kind of the recent the last you know 6 months have been dismaying to watch ultimately because it's it's yeah, yeah. required us as investors to pull back and really we're following the buyers yeah, and yeah. so you know, there, there are kind of really interesting dimensions there, including the question that, you know, just to to drop one more kind of maybe less popular concept on this call, but, you know, I'm not excited about projects uh, that, that just reduce emissions, but they have a lot of income benefits and time benefits yeah. for low income people. Yeah, and yeah. if those projects are competing instead with cement decarbonization via, via a clinker replacement project, actually, do we want to disadvantage those projects? It's a really interesting moral question that I don't have an answer to you. Matt, thank you. Uh, Faisal, uh, turning to you on the same question. So um, uh, it's interesting, you know, we just did a, a few months ago, we just completed a study on outcome bias just to think about uh, this precise question that Matt raised about how can we monetize uh, social value credits, sort of, uh, so to speak, in inverted commas. Um, and it sort of generated quite interesting ideas. Uh, so consider this. I mean, we all know that, say, clean cooking by volume of sort of finance is about, say, 5% of the overall market, right? So uh, so people who want to invest in clean cooking, uh, and, and if you're looking at decarbonization, you need volumes. Clean cooking is not the place to get it. So you would go somewhere else. So there's a particular reason why people come in, which is probably not to do with, as Matt was saying, on on uh, decarbonization, uh, but that's the only vehicle they have to maybe yeah. get yeah. social value credits. Yeah. So, uh, so one of the things we're thinking about is um, 
right now, since that's the only vehicle and that probably has a bit of a premium on the price, what you don't want to do is to start having a conversation about can you delink it? Uh, but at some point, for example, if we were better at measuring the methodologies around social value, um, uh, in much the same way as, as we do for the, the emission reduction piece, then we can start a journey towards a possible decoupling as, for instance, people move towards uh, carbon removals, the, the production market sort of uh, reduces, and the, the ETFs and so on in sort of global markets, particularly on the S side, uh, is looking at different ways of investing in social value credits beyond sort of carbon, right? So I think there's something there we, which we, we certainly want to, we've been engaging with social uh, finance, uh, with Shell Foundation, so we've been having that conversation out there to everybody else. Anybody who's interested, please, you know, we'd love to kind of work with you around this because we think this is part of the future pool of capital, not now, but somewhere down the line. Well, so you mentioned a report. Is that something that's in the public domain or is this an internal report? No, we're just to? finishing off the blog because when we did the report, many of the people uh, who were interviewed specifically asked for not to be quoted. So <laughs> we decided... <laughs> So we, we've decided not to do the report, but we'll do a blog, which should be coming out very soon. Brilliant. Um, fan fantastic. Um, OK, um, let's move on a, a little bit. Um, so one of the responses to the situation that we find ourselves in at the moment in relation to the carbon markets is a potential or potential really actual maybe trend to move away from offset projects towards carbon removal projects to what degree do you think that this is a potential threat to our uh, the, the clean cooking sector's um access to this this uh, kind of support and let's go to owen on this one yeah look, I, I mean i think yeah so we could, to get maybe just to acknowledge where the background of that removals point came from is largely due to science-based targets net zero standard work where they said um you can neutralize your residual emissions to claim net zero but there's two critical elements that were missing from that statement one is, or the way that statement was read anyway not what they said one was to be in that place you need to have decarbonized your own value chain by 95 percent and then you can only use removals and those per those removals also need to be permanent so no company can do that right now. There's not a single company in the world in that position. And so like the, the short answer to should you buy removals over reductions is no, <laughs> hard and fast, no, it's simply not true. Um, the, the, the bigger question for me, though, I think, and it relates back to the SDGs finance stuff, um, is how do we how do we make sure if if I'm right and I say companies must take responsibility by financing stuff and this is an essential thing to finance and nothing else really does it well, how do we make sure that's embedded so that it becomes the priority, not the kind of marginalized, well, that's quite expensive, I'll take something cheaper first. And I think the right way to think about that in the beyond value chain mitigation conversation, which you know, we've got something coming out on Monday about this and science-based targets later in the year, is to define what is an optimal mix of things to finance to take responsibility for a company's residual emissions. And if you did that and you aligned it with science right now, a big chunk of that would probably be methane reduction, right? But to me, whatever your, whatever your sector, whatever type of company you are, whether you're steel or agribusiness or something else, a, a proportion of that should go to restoration of nature and a proportion of that should go to community services and clean cooking. What that ratio is, I mean, there's academics on the call that would probably do a better job of figuring out a method for that. But let's, you know, for illustrative purpose, let's say 40% of the finance that you generate for taking responsibility for residual emissions goes to those two things. And then the other 60% optimizes with science or sectoral priorities. That conversation is completely missing. And so Although the voluntary carbon market and instruments to serve that responsibility bucket are helpful, they're very blunt at the moment. So people will buy what they feel like, what they like, what's available, what's cheap. Um, what we need them to do is buy what's really helpful to buy. And if we can optimize the instrument as well as make it bigger, like scale is not that helpful. Optimization is just as helpful as scale. And that's just absent from the conversation. So some guidance on what what mix of things you should finance and clean cooking should be a good chunk of that. Um, uh, and then you know it becomes legitimate. You, you know, companies almost have a mandate. They have to go and buy this stuff to be credible. That's how I think we can generate more value. Thanks very much, Owen. Um, Annalise, same question to you. Yeah, I think um, so. Admittedly, I come from a, 
a background in environmental engineering and looking at uh, cook stove adoption and household energy at large. So um, I, I come to the carbon market from, from cook stoves. Um, and so I guess from my perspective, I really want to improve the quality of cook stove projects and to not have buyers, you know, run, run away from cook stoves, but to also be able to then turn around and hand them something that, you know, make the changes necessary um, to hand them something that we can have confidence in. So we can um, still pursue offsets. Um, I will also say that just because my closest collaborator, my uh, senior author, Barbara Haya, um, would also say that she's been working in the offset space for, for 20 years. Um, so much, much longer than, than me. So I will also uh, have her voice poke through in, in this panel, but, um, you know, looking at making the, the changes necessary to increase the, the confidence and quality of offsets. Um, you know, she's been working on this for 20 years and she really has struggled to see, to see that change um, be made, which is also why, you know, this panel is so exciting to see the pushes right now in this turning point. Um, uh, and I hope that cook stoves can really lead the way not to be the face of overcrediting, but to be the face of confidence in the market because we made the changes first. Um, and so, but but Bar that's my hope. Um, uh, but I think Barbara would also say that she um, is optimistic about potentially moving towards like a contributions approach um, or something in that um, uh, in that space. And so I would, also, maybe if Owen could speak to, to that more, but um, just from, from my perspective, I'm optimistic about offsets um, and cook stove offsets specifically, um, but I also know that there's uh, at least thought or conversation um, on contributions as well. Annalise, thank you. Owen, did, did you want to come back on that quickly? Uh, yeah, super quick. I mean, I, I, I fully agree. I think, like, if I refer back to the squishiness ratio um, from earlier in the call, like, you know, if you want to resolve that squishiness ratio, you've got two choices. You either make the instrument, well, two choices. I mean, they can run in, they can be concurrent choices, not either or. Um, you either make the instrument less squishy, which is what Annalise says, like, let's let's tighten up. Um, uh, but you can make the claim more squishy um, and so you don't have such a binary you know you did or you did not offset which is you know this hostage to fortune and that's where the the contribution to and we're kind of framing this as more like companies to take responsibility for their ongoing emissions should make a fair contribution to global net zero efforts um, so there's a few words that are important there fair and contribution stick out um, fair being not just ton for ton but also an amount of money um, and that that money is spent on the right things and contribution shifts us away from this individualistic. Um, I made myself OK by buying you know, loads of removal credits for my historic emissions because you didn't really. Right. That's not that's not made it OK. Um, so we shift to those kind of I, I mean, I, I think it is, you know, in some ways a semantic shift and people have said, well, you know, it's just offsetting under another name. Um, but I think it's a really important semantic shift. I really do. Like if the mentality goes with it, then it becomes a very important semantic shift. I mean, thank you, and and Annalise uh, as well. Um, we're going to explore one more question, and then I'm going to go back to Hilda for a few final comments before I then then summarise. And the last question really is is kind of building on on this in a way in terms of um, the uh, the increasing integrity. Part of it comes from the projects that we're we're supporting on the ground and so on. But I think there's also the the core carbon principles and assessment framework of the ICVCM is, is something that you talked about in the um, in the report, Hilda, uh, and it's a, it's something that I think is has excited quite a lot of people ab about the the, um, the the importance, I guess, from that side as well. Um, sorry, it seems to be you again, Owen. Actually, the, the, in terms of who we've asked to, to to comment on this, I wondered what you made of the core carbon principles and assessment framework, and what how you see that likely to affect the sector going forward. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, again, two levels to that. I, I would say just at a general level, you know, there's nothing new in those principles that shouldn't already be in the market and is variously in the market now. But I don't say that as a bad thing. I think the consolidation of norms and the setting of a floor, i.e., you know, this is the least the carbon market should be doing. And again, that's not a very sexy way of portraying it. And I'm sure they wouldn't use that word, but it's not a, this is not an aspiration. This is a minimum standard and a, and a minimum standard is necessary. So like, yes. yeah, not very sexy, but necessary. Um, I think that part's you know good and, and in general we support it. We think it should do more to align with Paris, but you know, they'll they'll get there, I think. The 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 concern slash opportunity is the credit level when they start to look at activity types and methods. 
And I hear what the panelists said earlier about the usefulness of ratings agencies, but there's a danger there as well, because they're all, you know, there's an assumption the ratings agencies and ICBCM are unbiased. But, you know, if I was a rating agency, I would find things down. So it proves the need for my existence, right? So it's not unbiased. They're a private sector company themselves. So we need to be really careful that lots of private sector companies don't um, sort of end up being inconsistent with each other and the space fragments even more. So I think it points to, I can't remember which mat it was, uh, pointed towards a source of truth for clean cooking, which, you know, Faisal's organisation is a great place for that kind of work. You know, somewhere we can all look to and say, yeah, that's the right approach. We kind of get behind that. Those are the, the factors we should be using. But we shouldn't be leaving that to people that aren't experts in clean cooking. And, and for ICVCM to keep up with every methodology type and every activity type, I don't see as feasible. It's going to have to partner with the experts. And, and that, that's no disrespect to ratings agencies either. I think like very useful contribution. But what I'm seeing is, you know, on the same day, a blog from Calix and a totally different one from Silvera. They don't meet in the middle. That's not going to get us anywhere either. That's just going to confuse things even more. I mean, thank you very much. Um, that uh, uh, brings us pretty well to the end of the discussion. Um, I'd like to give Hilda a few minutes just to reflect on what we've heard and then I'll bring things to a close. So um, Hilda, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Um... And thank you also for all your thoughts. It's been a very interesting uh, conversation. I think the main um, point which is important to make, which you've all touched on actually, is um, is the need to somehow separate the greenhouse gas accounting from the price that programs receive, because I would argue that clean cooking programs are fundamentally undervalued in the carbon market. I mean, having been in households, I've been in hundreds of households that are using clean cooking technologies and they are really fundamentally changing women's lives. Um, and so, you know, to have them receive prices of four dollars a ton is just it doesn't make any sense. So so I think it's very important to also bring um, the buyers, and I see they're very much not really in these conversations, but to also help them really understand um, all the value and all the value. The carbon component is one portion of that value. They bring a lot more value beyond that. But to understand that value and also to understand the challenge that programs go through in order to even certify these um, emission reductions and that they should be offered, you know, a fair price, which does allow them to to do um, uh, digital monitoring, which is very expensive, or to to be very rigorous with how they're monitoring their performance. I mean, that's very expensive and time consuming to do. So um, I guess my sort of final call to action would be would be to have um, really think about giving these programs in the sole sector a price that really um, is fair and that really reflects the benefits that these programs are bringing and to separate that conversation from the greenhouse gas accounting conversation. Hilda, thank you so much. Um, and also uh, a big round of, of applause. Uh, it's going to be a virtual applause, I'm afraid, because we've got everyone else on mute to uh, all of our panellists. So I think I, I think everyone would agree it's been a, a really interesting and articulate uh, set of, uh, of conversations around these issues. Um, these are issues that MEX will continue to work on with all of the partners that are on this um, on this call. Um, I think certainly it's absolutely fundamental to the work that MEX started four years ago to make sure that when we're talking about access to clean cooking, we're also talking to, about issues to do with carbon. Uh, it was really interesting. I've just come back from the expert panel on the on SDG seven that was met that men in in the in the UN um, over the course of last week. And I think one of the really exciting things there is a, is a, is a growing recognition of the importance of yes, tracing and tracking the uh, ability to meet the 2030 targets, but also to do it in such a way that there is a comprehensive and integrated and articulated relationship between the meeting of those 2030 targets and the 2050 net zero targets and the fact that um, those targets are applicable to every country in the world, not just those with 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 really low rates of access to to, um, to clean cooking. So in other words, that actually the transition is a global transition 
um, and it's part of that. And that's maybe one way in which we could see other funding and cross funding going into the in, into the um, into this particular uh, set of issues. So we will continue to work on this. There's going to be lots of other reports and projects and initiatives going forward in this space. If you've enjoyed this um, uh, webinar, do join us for others. Do join those that will be operated by our colleagues from CCA uh, uh, and from other organisations uh, um, as, as we go forward. Um, so thanks all very much. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day and um yeah keep positive thanks Ted. thanks everybody thanks everyone thank you bye-bye thank you, thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.